Hey, this is Physics for Engineering. Our problem for today is wheel rolling down an inclined plane. We have a hill and we have a wheel. The wheel has a mass m and moment of tenacia i. The wheel rolls downhill without slipping with angular velocity omega, with linear acceleration a, and with the linear velocity v. And our task for today is to find the velocity of the wheel in the end of the hill and to find, find its angular acceleration. And we introduced today five different methods to solve this problem. We go now directly to the method number one, using the Newton's laws of motion. First of all, we need to define the forces acting on the wheel. This is a gravity force, this is the reaction force, and this is a friction force. We need to point here that there is no slip between the wheel and the heel. So this means that friction force is less than coefficient of friction times the reaction force. This is an important condition because it will define the kinetic relation between the velocity and angular velocity, and also it defines the amount of freedom of the system. We define the coordinate system as on the picture, and write the second Newton's law for the system. In our designation, I is the linear acceleration of the wheel. But this equation is not enough to solve the problem, because we have here two variables. One is the acceleration, linear acceleration, and the second is the friction force, which is not known. Therefore, we need one more equation. To obtain this equation, we move first our coordinate system to the center of the wheel and summarize all the torques acting on the wheel around this point. Since reaction force N and gravity force are directly through the center of the wheel, therefore we have only one torque, which is the friction force times the radius of the wheel. We also need to mention that in case if our coordinate system is connected to the center of the wheel, then the coordinate system will move also with the acceleration. And in this case, this is non inertial coordinate system. According to the D'Alembert principle, we must include one more inertial force acting on the center of the wheel, but the torque of this force will be zero, since the force is applied to the center of the wheel. Therefore, we have only one remaining torque, which is the F friction times the radius of the wheel. And this torque will be equal to the moment of the inertia of the wheel times the, times the angular acceleration beta. As the next step, we consider the relation between the linear velocity of the wheel and the angular velocity of the wheel, same as the linear acceleration and angular acceleration of the wheel. Therefore, we can now derive the friction force from the torque equation and substitute it to the first equation with the forces. As a result, we have only one equation with the linear acceleration of the wheel, in the end, we have solution to our problem. This is the linear acceleration of our wheel as a function of the wheel radius, its mass, and the slope. Okay, now we need to find the linear velocity of the wheel in the end of the slope. For this purpose, we need one more additional input. This is h. This is the distance between the vertical upper position of the wheel and the lower position of the wheel. In order to find the end velocity, we can use the known formula, which is connecting the cylinder path, the initial velocity v0, the end velocity v, and its linear acceleration i. In our case, initial velocity v0 is 0. Now, from this triangle, we can derive the x, the path of the cylinder from the top to the bottom position. This is nothing else like h divided by sine alpha. Then we connect these two last equations and substitute a to the upper equation. In this way, we can now derive the linear velocity of the wheel or cylinder in the end of the path. And now we have solution for our problem. We have linear acceleration a of the cylinder or wheel and we have linear velocity of the wheel. So we go now to the second method. The second method is conservation of the mechanical energy. We define the mechanical energy of the cylinder on the top position and on the bottom position. E1 is the potential energy of the cylinder on the top position, which is mgh, and on the, on the bottom position we have only kinetic energy, 
which is the result of the linear motion and rotational motion, mv squared divided by 2 and i omega squared divided by 2. We can use the kinematic relation between the linear and the angular velocity and consider conservation of the mechanical energy, which says E1 is equal to E2. And therefore, we have the following equation. And from this equation, we can quickly derive the final linear velocity of our view. And then we find the linear acceleration of the cylinder. We will do it in the same way as for the first method. Taking into consideration the relation between the pass, a velocity and acceleration, then we can measure x from this triangle, and then we have, as a final result, we have our linear acceleration. We can see that the formulas for the speed and acceleration are the same as we get by the first method. And now we go to the third method. The third method is with consideration of the instant center of rotation. This time, we connect the coordinate system to the point where the wheel is connected to the slope. We call it M capital. And we use this fact that the point M capital on the wheel, which is connected to the slope, has always zero velocity. And now imagine that we can freeze in time. And in such a condition, our coordinate system has a zero velocity, and we can consider it as an inertial reference frame. This means we can use the Newton's laws in this situation. In this point of time, the wheel will roll over the point M with the angular acceleration beta. As the next step, we define the forces acting on the wheel and write torques acting on the wheels around the M point. The reaction and friction force give us zero torque, therefore we have the torque only from the gravity force. And this torque will be equal to the inertia of the wheel around the M point times its angular acceleration. For this purpose, we will use the parallel axis theorem, or Steiner's theorem, which says that moment of inertia of the wheel around the M point is equal to its own moment of inertia I plus MR square. Then we consider the relation between the linear and the angular acceleration of the wheel and substitute both formulas to the first torque equation. The result formula will lead us to the quick solution of our problem, which is the same as by the first and second method. The linear velocity we can obtain by the same way as in the second method. And we go further to the fourth method. This is the method with consideration of non-inertial reference frame. This time, we connect our coordinate system to the wheel and we let coordinate system to move together with the wheel downhill. In this case, the coordinate system is the non-inertial reference frame since thinks it moves with the linear acceleration. In such a condition, we define the forces acting on the wheel, same as before, this is the gravity force, reaction force, and the friction force. But since we have a deal with non-inertial reference frame, we are not allowed to use the Newton's laws. In this case, we can use D'Alembert's principle which says that in non-inertial reference rain, we can use an inertial force, Fn, which is acting on the center of the wheel, and then we can use the second Newton laws with this force. With the new inertial force, we have two torques acting on the wheel around our coordinate system. This is the torque given by the gravity and the torque, Fn times r, of the inertial force. The wheel is spinning in the new coordinate system, therefore the result of these two torques is equal to the moment of inertia of the wheel times the angular acceleration. According to the D'Alembert's principle, the inertial force is equal to the mass of the body times the linear acceleration of the non-inertial reference frame with the negative sign, which means Fn is equal ma for the absolute values. The negative sign is already considered for the equation of the torques. We add here the relation between the linear and the angular acceleration and substitute both formulas to the first equation. And in this way, we obtain the solution of our problem as the linear acceleration of the wheel. 
Okay, fifth method is Lagrangian mechanics. The rolling body has the linear velocity and the angular velocity. And first of all, we need to write the kinetic energy of the wheel, which is based on the second part of the Koenig's theorem, is the energy of the linear motion and the spinning motion of the rolling object. With consideration of the relation between the linear and angular velocity of the wheel, we can rewrite the kinetic energy in the following form. The next step is to define the generalized force. The definition of the generalized force is the following. Let us have a look on the forces acting on the wheel. Since the contact point between the wheel and slope has a zero velocity, the friction force or stiction force does not provide any work on the wheel, and therefore it is not the part of generalized force. The reaction force N does not provide any work on wheel as well, since it is perpendicular to the linear velocity and it is also not included in the generalized force. Therefore, the projection of the gravity force mg sin alpha is only the part of the generalized force. The next step is to write the Lagrange's equation and substitute the kinetic energy and generalized force in this equation. And in this way, we can obtain the solution for our problem, the linear acceleration of the rolling wheel. Most probably, this is not the easiest way to solve this problem, Nevertheless, we need to mention that Lagrangian mechanic is the most generic method to solve the complex mechanical system, which includes a lot of objects and several degree of freedoms. And the Lagrangian mechanics is the recommended method in such cases. And this is all for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.